Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. It is an incredible honor and uh, pleasure to introduce uh, America's 19th and 21st uh, Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy. We're so grateful to have you here with us today. Well, thank you so much, Evan. I'm really looking forward to our conversation, and I'm so happy that we're here to talk about mental health, which is a subject I care deeply about. You've been such an incredible and passionate advocate for mental health. And I just want to thank also our partners, uh, Active Minds, and of course, uh, Club Unity for bringing this, uh, bringing this event together and for all of their support on such important topics. Um, so I guess maybe before we dive into the great questions we received uh, from the students, perhaps you could just share a little bit of your own personal journey. I mean, how, how did you end up as the Surgeon General? Why are you so passionate uh, about mental health? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, it wasn't because it was part of a five or 10 year plan. Uh, in fact, when I was a kid, I, I remember seeing C. Everett Koop, one of our former surgeons general, my predecessor uh, on TV talking about smoking and HIV. And, and I had a great respect for his work, but never thought I would uh, serve as surgeon general one day or much less serve in government. Uh, so it was a bit unexpected. You know, I was training in medicine. I was uh, building a technology company at the time and was really interested in technology. I was you know, getting involved in, in health policy advocacy related work, but all from the outside. Um, and it was uh, quite a, a unexpected one day uh, that I got a call from uh, then the uh, Obama administration asked me if I would be interested in serving as Surgeon General. But I found that it was a, one, an extraordinarily meaningful uh, opportunity to serve, but one that interestingly brought together much of my background in technology and public health and advocacy and community organizing, and of course, uh, in medicine. You know, mental health became uh, early on an important area of focus for me for a couple of reasons. Most importantly, because it was what I was hearing time and time again from people all across America as I traveled our country and went to big cities and small towns, spoke at schools uh, and at universities, as well as at workplaces and government buildings. And I just kept hearing again, sometimes in sad, sometimes in unsaid ways, that people were really struggling uh, with their mental health and well being. They were worried about the mental health of their kids. Uh, of other people in their life. And they were also struggling with loneliness, which was a, a profound challenge uh, for people and continues to be, especially during this pandemic. But they wouldn't say things like, I'm really struggling with my mental health or I'm feeling lonely. Uh, people would say things like, you know, I, I feel like the burden of everything that's happening in my life is almost too much to bear. Or I feel like I have to deal with it all by myself. Or if I feel like I disappeared tomorrow, nobody would even notice. Uh, hearing this again and again really helped me understand that there was something deeper that was happening in our country beyond what I was seeing and had seen, uh, you know, in, in the hospital treating patients with physical illnesses. And frankly, it reminded me of it, my personal experiences also just as a child struggling with loneliness and with other mental health concerns. And then later seeing, you know, among the patients I cared for in the hospital and in clinic, that there were far, there were far more people who were struggling with their mental health than I ever anticipated when I was in medical training. So putting it all together, uh, I came out of that experience as a Surgeon General the first time, recognizing that our mental health is not only such a critical part of our overall, our overall well-being, but it is a part of, of our health that we're really struggling with. And we're often, that a lot of that struggle is taking place behind the scenes, if you will, uh, behind the curtain. People aren't talking about it as much as they do about physical illness, which means that we are not able to acknowledge what's happening to us, much less get the help. Uh, to people that they so desperately need. One of the things that you worked on was a book called uh, Together, The Healing Power of Human Connection in a Sometimes Lonely World, which I believe talks a bit about some of the topics you just addressed, especially around loneliness. Can you talk a little bit about what you learned in the process of, of writing that book? Yes, well, you know, I, I learned so much, you know, both, and a lot of this, again, stemmed from this was incredibly enriching conversations I had with people across the country, both when I was surgeon general and afterward. And they, they taught me were really two critical things about, about loneliness. One is that it's incredibly common, but the number of people who struggle with loneliness is far greater than the number of people who, struggle, who have diabetes in our country, yet we wouldn't know that uh, based on the news that we read and the conversations we have. The second thing I learned was that loneliness is consequential for our mental health and for our physical health. Turns out the people who struggle with loneliness are at higher risk of depression and anxiety, but also at higher risk for heart disease, for premature death, for dementia, for sleep disturbances, and the list goes on. 
And so putting those together, I came to realize pretty quickly that we have a profound challenge on our hands that we have to address. And that's a challenge in the crisis of loneliness. It's not unique, by the way, to the United States. Many other countries have noticed similar trends in the UK and Australia and other parts of Europe. Uh, around the world, people have noticed that double digit percentages of their populations are struggling with loneliness and it's having a real impact. It also has an impact, by the way, not just on your health, but on productivity in the workplace and creativity and retention. It has an impact on how kids do in school and on how we show up for our family and friends. So it became clear to me that loneliness is a public health crisis. It's a challenge that we can meet, but to first meet it, we have to acknowledge it. And, so that, and that means that for many of us, we have to recognize that it's a challenge in our own life and that it's okay, that it doesn't mean that we're broken or socially deficient in some way if we struggle with loneliness. All of us at some point in our lives will struggle uh, with loneliness. And it's not about the number of people you have around you. It's really about the quality of your relationships. It's about how open and vulnerable you can be with others. Uh, it's about how much of yourself you can truly bring to your relationships uh, and your conversations. And that is where I think we have more work to do, more benefit that we can gain and more connection ultimately we can build in people's lives and across society. One of the things that you mentioned is, you know, how many people are, are struggling with that feeling of loneliness. Do you, do you have advice for those of us who have friends or family members who are struggling with mental health issues? What, what can we do to help? What are steps that, that we can take when we see, you know, a, a friend that's really struggling? Yeah, it's a great question. I'll say this is somebody who myself struggled with loneliness for many years and has experienced that, you know, in bouts and during adulthood as well, including when I served as Surgeon General the first time. Uh, but I think there, the good news is that all of us can do something uh, to assist with addressing loneliness in the lives of others and in our own lives. And you don't have to be a doctor or a nurse or have some public health training in order to, to respond. You just need uh, the willingness to show up uh, as yourself and to be present for others. But here are a couple of concrete things that help. So number one, making sure that you spend at least some time each day uh, reaching out to people you love, even if that's 10 or 15 minutes, can make a huge difference in your life. That could be 10 minutes that you spend making a phone call like on the way to work. It could be 10 minutes that you spend writing an email to somebody that you've been out of touch with uh, for a while. But that 10 minutes matters. The second thing to remember is that the quality of our time with other people matters. And that means that being present, giving people the benefit and the gift of our full attention can have an extraordinary impact on the conversation. If you've ever had the, the, the joy, Evan, of being in conversation with somebody where they were fully present, where they were listening to you with, with their full attention, where they didn't have their phone distracting them, where they weren't uh, trying to check, tick through their to-do list you know, for work at the same time, but they were truly fully present with you. You know what a gift that is and how beautiful it feels. And five minutes of fully present conversation can often be more rewarding than a half hour of distracted conversation. And the third thing I'll mention that can be very powerful to connecting us with others is actually service. And this was an unexpected lesson for me. Uh, but it turns out that when we seek each other out uh, for opportunities to serve, we not only build a bridge to someone else, but we remind ourselves that we have value to bring to the world. Now, why is this so important? Because it turns out that one of the great consequences of loneliness is that it chips away at our self-esteem. Over time, it makes us think that the reason we're lonely is that we're not worthy, that we're not the kind of person that people would want to spend time around, that we're not fun, we're not entertaining, we're not you know, handsome or beautiful, like we're just not good enough. And over time, we can come to internalize that. But when we serve other people, we're reminded that we do have something beautiful and beneficial to bring to the world. And so acts of service, as, as counterintuitive as it might seem, you might think if I'm lonely, I need somebody to engage with me, not me to go and engage and try to serve somebody else. But it turns out that that is one of the most powerful antidotes we have. So these three acts are very, very simple things that we can do. And service, keep in mind, doesn't have to be going to a soup kitchen and, and donating your time. Service can be reaching out to a friend who's struggling and offering them uh, your ear. It can be getting food delivered uh, to a, a fellow parent who you know might be struggling to homeschool their kids and get their kids back and forth to school if they're in person and uh, make sure that they're teleworking and doing all that you know, at the same time. There are many ways that we can serve. And finally, I'll just remind people of this, Evan, that these are deceptively simple solutions. Because it turns out that we are hardwired as human beings to connect with one another. And when we give ourselves just a little bit of an opportunity, a little bit of freedom, a little bit of permission, if you will, to reach out, to be vulnerable, 
to be open with others, then we, our system responds. Our body craves that kind of connection. Uh, sometimes we have to get through our own inhibitions, you know, and, and our own, and the stigma that we may have internalized around loneliness or reaching out or being vulnerable. But that is meant, that is really who we are. And we're meant to be connected to one another. Well, it's such an inspiring message, especially for the team of young people that came together as Club Unity to try to make a positive impact. So thank you so much for that. One, one of the things that you just mentioned about stigma really connects to a question that one of uh, the students asked. So let me let me jump to that question for a second here. Uh, Kiana Victor, a student at Randallstown High School, uh, said that mental health is a significant stigma in, in many communities, and especially with older generations. Uh, which often challenges students who seek emotional support. So what do you think a student should do if they're facing these challenges and how can they you know, get help if, if maybe you know, they're, they're having trouble finding that in their community? Well, let me just tell you, I re deeply resonate with that question because many of us, myself included, come from cultures or communities where mental health is looked down upon or shoved into a closet you know, and, and looked at with some degree of embarrassment. You know, I remember when I was in high school, and I found out that my uncle had taken his life. I was actually the first one to find out. Uh, and I remember just the, the shock of that moment and calling my parents and talking to them and having to, uh, all of us then call relatives in India and explain what had happened to my uncle. And this sense of shame that I remember feeling from that the extended family was really palpable. You know, people didn't want to talk about what happened. They worried it would reflect badly on the family uh, and it would cause all kinds of other consequences. So uh, that sent a, a I think a harmful message to me as a, as a young person that, that it's not okay to struggle with your mental health. But I think the, the good news is that we know, uh, in fact, that a lot of people struggle with their mental health. This is not just a problem of the few. This is a problem of the many. Uh, it is a common challenge and hence has to be a common cause that we unite behind. And even if you're from a community or a culture that doesn't acknowledge uh, or, or readily embrace, you know, uh, uh, speaking openly about mental health and seeking help, I think it's you, what I, it's important for you to know is that if you're a student on campus, if you are working, you know, in the community, that there are very likely people around you who are struggling too. Uh, and being able to number one, uh, share your story, you know, openly with a few uh, trusted friends, even if they're not from your community, um, that can be a very powerful and very liberating. Can also give them permission to step forward and share their story. And every day, more and more people are stepping up to share what their struggles are with mental health. You see it certainly in the papers with athletes, you know, like Naomi Osaka, uh, Simone Biles and others uh, speaking courageously and openly about what they're dealing with. But it's happening behind the scenes as well in workplaces, in schools, on university campuses. The second thing I think I wanna to emphasize to you is that seeking help in terms of counseling services, uh, which are often offered uh, through health plans on campus and also uh, through health plans that people get from their workplaces, this is not at all something people should be ashamed of. You know, counseling can be one of the most powerful and empowering steps that you take uh, to help you think through the challenges you're dealing with, to help process uh, some of what we are all going through, especially during this pandemic, which is an incredibly hard time. So don't feel that you're somehow conceding or giving in uh, if you're seeking counseling. It's a very powerful step. I think of it in some ways as uh, like signing up to go to the gym. When we sign up to go to the gym, you don't think, oh gosh, I'm throwing the towel in. I can't can't exercise and get fit on my own. So I got to sign up for the gym. Like we don't really think about it that way. We see it as a positive step that we're taking for our physical fitness and seeking out help in the form of a counselor or other services is, is very, very similar. So I would think about it that, that way as well. And finally, just, just recognize this, that you know, over our course of our life, we're all going to go through uh, mental health challenges. Uh, what makes a difference uh, often, one of the factors between those who manage to not only uh, survive despite those challenges, but thrive, uh, are the people who are willing to speak up, to seek help, uh, to, to confront um, with the challenges that they're dealing with. The longer we don't confront them, uh, the longer they persist, the more deeply uh, they can affect us. But on the other hand, if we address our mental health challenges early on, we can actually turn them into strengths. They can make us more uh, open and vulnerable and, and, and able to connect with other people. They can make us more empathic and more understanding of the challenges that other people go through. And finally, just keep this in mind. This challenge, the conversation we tend to have a lot is about mental health in the context of mental illness. But mental health is so much more than whether or not you have diagnosable depression or anxiety. It's much more than the absence of illness. But we know that our well, mental health and well-being exists on a spectrum. Part of that spectrum is illness. 
but we can also not have diagnosable illness and still not be doing great, right? We can be in a funk, if you will, you know, for a prolonged period of time, just kind of feeling out of it, feeling drained uh, emotionally. And so part of focusing on our well-being is not just, again, about preventing illness. It's about functioning on the optimal end of our well-being scale. And if we do that, uh, we can not only feel better, but we can do better in our relationships, in school, and at work. When I was younger, I really struggled with my parents' divorce and counseling made a, a huge difference in, in my life. So I, I couldn't agree more, uh, you know, and it, it helped me think about my own experience and my own emotions really differently, which helped me as I, as I got older. So I, I definitely think that's such an important uh, resource. We, we have another, uh, another great question here from Emma Smith, who's a student at Drexel University. And Emma asked about the intersection between mental health crises and other public health crises facing our country. I think in particular, the addiction crisis, which is something that you've spent a lot of time working on. Do you mind sharing your uh, thoughts about this and, and how we can have more of these uh, conversations about the intersection of, of many of these issues? Well, it's, Emma, it's such a good question that she asks because there is a deep connection between our mental health and our physical health. And we've learned that over the years. I saw that firsthand uh, as a doctor. And if you think about the physical challenges that we're dealing with, uh, whether it's heart disease or diabetes or obesity, we know that our mental health has a real impact you know, on, these, on these conditions. And that when we do better in terms of our mental health, we're often able to do better in terms of sticking to a care plan, let's say for our physical health, uh, whether that's taking our medications or staying on an exercise plan or staying on a diet plan. These things are better when our mental health uh, is better. On the other hand, when we are struggling in terms of our mental health, it makes everything harder. Uh, and we've seen that you know, up close. You know, so, so many times I recognize and when I was uh, you know, practicing and I was in clinic and in the hospital that sometimes what a, a patient needed when they weren't taking their medications was not, was not another reminder of the importance of taking their medications. They often knew that, but there were often other struggles that they were dealing with in their life, uh, which drained them energetically and made it harder to really focus on some other aspects of their physical health. The other thing though I would note though, which is more of a biological connection, is that when we are under a great deal of stress, whether that's because uh, you know, of circumstances in our life or loneliness or other such uh, factors, that stress in the short term, sometimes stress can be beneficial. You know, it can motivate us, for example, to get a presentation together to like, you know, for a job interview, for you know, an athletic performance, a race or something we may be getting ready for. But in the long term, stress actually can be destructive. It can increase inflammation in our bodies, which can lead to damaging, uh, you know, to damages to our, our blood vessels and our tissues and increase our risk of chronic illnesses, including cardiovascular disease. So we know that chronic stress, uh, which can often accompany, uh, you know, stressful situations, loneliness, and other mental health conditions can have a deleterious effect, you know, on inflammation and on disease, uh, you know, genesis down the line. So there are umpteen reasons to now, uh, that we, we now understand why there's such a deep connection. So the bottom line is if we want to be healthier as a country, we want to lower our rates of heart disease and obesity, as well as improve our mental health and well-being. It makes sense to focus on our emotional well-being and to ask ourselves the question, how can we do better in terms of preventing uh, mental crises and mental illness? How can we build stronger social connection, recognizing that it is our bonds with one another that are the foundation and we would build on which we build our health, but also everything else, you know, our relationships. Uh, as well as our performance and work and how we show up in society. One of the real crises that we've been working on here at Snapchat is the fentanyl crisis, where young people sometimes who are struggling with mental health issues think they're experimenting with a, a prescription pill um, that might make them you know, feel differently. And instead, that pill is laced with fentanyl and, and can lead to death. And when we've been communicating with our community about this, we found that a lot of young people don't even know about fentanyl. They don't know about the risks. They don't know that you know a, a amount of fentanyl equal to a grain of sand can be lethal. So, what what are some of the things that young people should know uh, about fentanyl? How does this you know intersect with the mental health issues that that you and I have been discussing? And what can we do as a community to make sure that that young people you know uh, are are not uh, you know, are not dying uh, from, from fentanyl? Well, it's such an important question, Evan, because we've been struggling with an opioid crisis for many years now, and fentanyl is one of the more powerful opioid medications, uh, which unfortunately has led to the death of many people in our country over the last several years. And often it gets 
as you mentioned, uh, it sort of it spikes essentially other products, and so a lot of times people don't even know that they're taking a product that has fentanyl in it, uh, and they don't recognize how powerful what they're ingesting is or inhaling is. So a couple of things like to know: one is there is a very strong connection between our mental health and substance use disorders. We see that overlap all the time, and when people struggle, in fact, with greater depression and with bouts of anxiety, when they have increased stress in their lives, that can often be a trigger actually for a relapse, a uh, reason for them to turn to substances, um, you know, in part to numb the pain uh, that they feel. And so while it's understandable, it's extraordinarily harmful. And so it's yet another reason why it's so important we address some of these upstream factors that drive our mental health. But the other thing that's is really important to know when it comes to not just fentanyl, but opioids uh, more broadly, is that these are highly, highly addictive substances. You know, you may know of people who have had them uh, and maybe they did okay. They got through uh, you know, a round of opioids after they had a surgery or something and had opioids for pain. But we now know something in much more, uh, with much more clarity that we didn't understand as fully 20 years ago, which is that these are some of the most addictive substances that we prescribe uh, and that none of us can assume uh, that we are going to be immune uh, from the addictive potential of these medications, that we can somehow just try it a couple of times and we'll be fine. Um, but these have real serious consequences. And so one, for recreational purposes, I would really caution people against using uh, these medications. They are harmful. I have seen up front how they tear people's lives apart and tear communities apart. I've seen promising young people who are extraordinarily talented uh, lose their potential, their lives, their family, their relationships because of opioid uh, use disorders. So this is, I would treat these with medicine, medicines with respect, and certainly they're not recreational in nature. Second, even if you do need opioids for medical purposes, it's important to be informed uh, and to be able to have a conversation with your doctor about whether there are alternatives to those pain medications. And if there are not, you need that level of, of pain medication in your life uh, to ask what's the shortest possible course you could take. Uh, because again, the shorter you remain on these opioid medications when they're prescribed, the better it is for you. And finally, and finally, I just remind people of this, that sometimes some of the most powerful advice that you can get comes from your friends. And that means that you are an incredibly important resource for the people in your life. And if you see people using or misusing these substances, never hesitate to have a conversation with them if you're worried. And I know that's hard, right? It feels like you're butting into someone else's business, or that you're being nosy, that you're uh, somehow being preachy with them. But let me tell you this, of the many people that I have known and cared for who have lost loved ones over the years uh, to opioid use overdoses, so many of them wish that somebody in their loved one's life had thought to say something early on when they first noticed that there was a problem. So never doubt that it's a conversation that you have with somebody, with a friend who you see is having a hard time or misusing opioids. That conversation may be one that helps save their life. And that's the only way we get through crises like these. It's not just by doctors and nurses talking about these public health issues. It's by each of us looking around us, the people in our life, and speaking up when we see a problem, reminding people that we are there to support them, uh, even though the crisis with the opioid use uh, disorder is a fierce one. Uh, but it's one that we know we can get through. There's medication that helps. There's counseling services that help. We have more experience with that now than ever before. We know it saves lives. We just have to help people get that help. And that's where all of us can come in uh, and help the people we love, you know, who may be struggling. One thing I'd really love to hear your perspective on, I know our community is really interested in, is the role that internet platforms can play in mental health. I mean, it seems like there's probably a, a positive role based on some of the comments you made earlier about people being able to connect with friends and build deeper relationships. There's also probably negative uh, you know, impacts of internet platforms as well. Do you mind just talking uh, a, a little bit about some of those positives and negatives and how you view the role of internet platforms um, in mental health? Well, absolutely, Evan, and, and I'm glad you asked because it, you know, it turns out that technology at the end of the day is a tool, right? It's how we use it that determines whether it helps us or whether it harms us. And I think that there's a lot of benefit that people can get in their lives from social platforms, uh, the opportunity to, to find a community where they may not have one, to share experiences uh, in initially safer settings, uh, to find resources and help, uh, you know, and to build relationships. That can all be very, very positive. But a couple of things that I do worry about. One is that to, in order to really achieve those benefits, we have to be very thoughtful in how we design social platforms. 
So number one, we have to, from the beginning, know what our goal is, right? And, and if our goal is to, to help support the mental health and well-being of people, to help them build healthy relationships, then we have to design our platforms uh, and, and design from an engineering to a front-end design perspective uh, in order to achieve those ends. What I think is much more problematic is if we build platforms that ultimately do a ton of harm and then try to set up side programs for people who end up having problems in the end to say, okay, here's a resource to help you. To me, that's the equivalent of a tobacco company manufacturing cigarettes and then funding cessation programs on the side. You know, the better thing is to not produce and sell the cigarette in the first place. And so I think that engineering our platforms with an idea in mind initially of how we enhance and contribute to mental health, positive mental health, I think is, is one piece. I think the second has to do with, with data and with data transparency, which is that there's a tremendous amount of data that social platforms collect, uh, a lot of which speaks to the impact that they may be having, the sentiment essentially that, uh, that their consumers and that their users uh, are experiencing at a given point in time. Being able to understand what kind of sentiment we are generating, um, what kind of experience users are having is really important, but making that available for researchers and the public to understand and analyze independently is also very important. It's not just important for the end overall outcome, but in this day and age in particular, where we've seen so much uh, harm transacted on certain social media platforms, it's important from a trust perspective uh, to make sure that the public understands that, okay, we can trust a company because it's being open and transparent with its data. And the third thing I'd say has to be do with misinformation. We know, unfortunately, that you know misinformation in general about health is not new, right? People have been uh, trafficking in misinformation for generations. But what is new is the speed and scale and really sophistication with which misinformation is spreading. And it's having consequences for our health. There are people who have consumed misinformation about COVID-19, for example, and have been led to believe that it's no different than the common cold or the flu and have lost their lives as a result because they didn't think it was necessary to take precautions. There are people who have turned away from the vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine, a vaccine which we know can save lives and has saved many lives already because they ran into misinformation online, which told them that, uh, that the vaccine somehow causes COVID itself, which it does not, or that it causes infertility, which it does not. So misinformation is, is in a profound challenge that we face. And as we think, Evan, about how to prepare for the next pandemic, how to protect our health, Guarding against the rampant spread of health misinformation will be top among the, the priorities that we have to focus on. And social media platforms are incredibly important here because we know that a tremendous amount of information is transacted on these sites, including misinformation. And so being uh, thoughtful about how we proactively address that, how we ensure that algorithms don't end up inadvertently amplifying misinformation, uh, making sure that we are there too being transparent with data so people know how much misinformation is being transacted and what interventions are working to address it. This is incredibly important for us to create social media platforms that contribute to a healthy information environment as opposed to what we have now, which I think is a profoundly unhealthy information environment, which is costing people their lives. Perhaps we can end on a question from one of the students uh, who Kelly, uh, Kelly McGuire uh, from Florida Gulf Coast University, who asked, what do you believe are the most pressing mental health issues today in the United States? And what steps do you think as young people we can take to create positive change? Well, that's a great question. And, and I, I love this question because I, I think inherent in it is a note of optimism. And I'm an optimistic person. And I actually think I feel more optimistic about our chances of building a culture around mental health that's positive and uplifting than I ever have uh, in my public health career. And I'll tell you why I feel so optimistic. It's actually because of young people in our country who have taken charge of having a conversation about mental health in their universities, in their workplaces, in their communities, and are driving that change forward. You know, Evan, I'll tell you something that, that you know really well as a CEO, uh, better than most people do, which is that culture is what drives a company, an organization, a country, right? Culture is more important than any policy you can put in place. It dictates what your real lip policies are. And when it comes to mental health, uh, we have to change our culture, right? From one that says your mental illness is something to be ashamed of and people who struggle with their mental health are weak to one that says mental health is part and parcel of our overall health. And when we focus on it, when we speak up about our struggles, when we talk about how to strengthen our mental health and well-being, we ultimately make ourselves stronger 
and more resilient. And we create a community where no one has to feel ashamed or left out. How do you create, how do you create that kind of culture though? Well, that is changing culture is one of the hardest things we do, but we change that conversation by conversation. We change that when people stand up and share their story with courage, uh, when they call upon their universities and their employers to provide the kind of mental health resources uh, that, that people need, uh, which many employers are doing now, many universities are doing now, which makes me incredibly proud to see that shift you know, in, in workplaces and schools. Um, and culture also changes when, when people see that there is help available and when it's normalized, uh, the whole process of actually getting help where you know, going to see a counselor feels like going to the physical therapist. So this is how culture changes. And as we're young people who are out there, I just want them to know that you don't have to have a seat in Congress. You don't have to, um, sorry, this one's like my, my kids have come home. So, <laughs> But what I want young people to know is that you don't have to be a policymaker or run a major company uh, for you to, uh, to be able to change a culture on mental health. You just have to have the courage to share your story. You have to have the courage to call for change, to advocate for change. And that's what a lot of young people are doing. That's why I feel optimistic we can change uh, our culture on mental health and ultimately create, I think, a society and a culture that's healthier and stronger because it embraces mental and physical well being. Well, just in time, uh, wrapping up here now that your family uh, is home. Thank you so much, Dr. Murthy. This has been an incredible inspiration and honor. And thank you so much uh, for your service to our great country. We're just so grateful that you could be here with us today. Well, thank you so much, Evan. And thank you for everything you're doing to advance a conversation on mental health and well-being. This is, I believe, one of the most important conversations of our time. And the changes that we make now will serve our country for generations to come, uh, in including my uh, son who just walked in here, who got home from school. And uh, he's a kindergartner. But my hope is that um, as he grows up, that he won't see mental illness and mental health struggles as something to be ashamed of, but he'll see it for what it is, which is part of being human and something we should all be able to talk about, a place where we can all help each other. Well, thank you so much and have a, have a great time with your family. We really, really appreciate it. Well, and thank nice you so much, you. Evan. Take care. All right, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.